Hey, hey, welcome back to part two of my home office build. Today we're going to cover this floating cabinet with sliding doors, integrated mail slot organizer folder thing, and integrated LED lighting below and within the cabinet itself. It's a little bright out so you can't really tell, but it's there. So let's head out to the shop and get started. Let's start this thing off at the table saw. So just like the floating desk and the window seat, this floating cabinet will be made out of white oak and white oak plywood. So first I can rip a couple strips down for the top and bottom of the cabinet and make a pencil mark there for some reason. And when we look at the design of this cabinet and we explode the face frame and zoom in on these dividers, you can see it's two pieces of plywood sandwiched together with a thin hardwood strip to cover that plywood edge. So back at the table saw, I can cut some plywood for those dividers and cut them to length and stack them up nicely and then glue them together. Making sure I have a nice even smear of glue, I can clamp those together with, oh yeah, keep clamping, more here, here. Got to need pressure everywhere with a call in the middle for even pressure across. Oh boy, there's three old big plywood sandwiches. And the next day I could release them from the clamps and show off my cat-like reflexes with that 48-inch clamp. Get everything cleared out of the way. And then over at the bandsaw, I could resaw some white oak down into those thin strips. And then over at the planer, nice down to an even thickness. And then glue those on using some calls again, just for nice even pressure all the way across. And a quick check under the undercarriage. Now this cabinet will be hung on the wall using a French cleat. So I'll rip down some plywood with a 45 degree bevel on it. And then I could set my table saw fence to match the thickness of that plywood. And that's where I'm gonna cut my groove for my plywood back. I'll have to make two passes with that eighth inch blade to match the one quarter inch, well, <laughs> not really one quarter inch, what they call a quarter inch plywood. And then double check every piece to make sure it's sliding nicely and it won't fight me when I assemble it. And then I could rip that plywood back down to final width. I also trim up those double thick dividers, make them nice and square, and then stack them for you just so you can see that I made three. Since I'll be using a one and a half inch thick face frame all around this, I'm padding out the end panels so there isn't a huge gap behind the face frame. And for said face frame, I'm using one by four riffs on white oak, ripping that down to an inch and a half. Now for my end styles, I will not rip those to an inch and a half. I leave those a little bit long for scribing. Now to avoid using any nails, I'm using the domino to attach the face frame. You can use biscuits or you could face nail it and fill the holes or you could just glue it and then sand it flush. Your call. I like the domino. I like the snap in, the alignment, and I know it's set. But I know not everyone has the domino, so just use whatever you're comfortable with. So this is where we run into a problem because that groove needs to be cut right on the front edge and it's going to go into our mortise slots. So for the bottom, I can actually glue this piece on and then cut this groove and it will just cut partially through the domino, no problem. So with some glue applied, I could pop that front face frame on and then start my next clampathon, where I go from one to, whoa, how many is that? Twelve-ish. Next, I needed to figure out the location of my dividers so that they were evenly spaced. So I took an overall measurement, subtracted the width of the dividers, and came up with 20 and 17 30 seconds, or 521.4937 millimeters. And there you go. Three big old plywood dominoes. So to cut the groove for the sliding door track, I'm using a plunge router with a quarter inch spiral up cut bit. And hey, boy, look at that. It is spiraling right up that sawdust. I had to make two passes because it was about 5 16 of an inch the channel needed to be. And then I could dry fit it. I'm using this Hafel rolling door hardware, which I got from Rockler. It's okay. It's not great, but it'll do the job. Now the top groove was a little different because the face frame hangs down and the track will sit behind it. Parentheses, at least that's what I thought. I made this groove with a routing bit. And it was at this point that I realized <laughs> That track can't fit flush up against the face frame and have the door slide, so I clamped it up, glued it, and then glued on an auxiliary filler strip. Now trying to balance a router on a thin two inch strip can be very difficult. So I put this little kind of outrigger with double sided tape on the bottom base of my router. Then I could just glide on down smoothly. I had to do the same thing here with two passes to create the 5 16 
And then I just glued on this little block to fill that void. I don't think it was really necessary, but then I could test my doors, making sure they slide freely without any obstructions. Now, the other note of clearance I needed to be weary of was the back of the door to the divider. So once I had nice clearance there, I could mark that and rip those to final width on the table saw. And now it was time to domino all the dividers to the top and the bottom of the cabinet. So clamping those down and then plunging into the dividers themselves and then into the base. Got everything aligned. Do a quick test fit here just to make sure that will work. So I just continued on down the line doing the other two the same way. Now, if you don't have a domino, uh, biscuits will work, dowels will work. I mean, you could screw from the underside and plug those screw holes as well. And with one side done, I could do the same to the other side and then do a quick dry fit to make sure everything fits together nicely before we start slinging any glue. But first, the sliding doors. So the two sliding doors need to be roughly 21 and an eighth, 21 and a quarter inches long. Since I'm doing 5 eighths of an inch strips, I need 16 of those. 5 eighths, and then I'll need 17 spaces at 19 30 seconds of an inch. Once that all is added up and calculated and computed, and we have a one inch border, half inch on each side, we end up with 21 and an eighth, roughly, width of a door. In order to get these spaced exactly how I want, I could build a sled, almost like a box joint jig, and I would have a tooth that width, and then I could just keep stepping this over and cutting all my grooves but I don't feel like making a sled just for that purpose. So I'm just gonna use some spacer blocks and I put some paper down on the table saw. So after I make my first cut, I'll draw the line where I need the fence to move over to and I'll move it over to that, lock it down, put the spacer down here, draw another line and just keep moving it over. So with that first space needing to be 19, 30 seconds, bring my fence over. And then for every cut after that, I'll need to move over 19, 30 seconds plus five eighths, which is the width of the dado blade. Now in retrospect, it's really not necessary to cut any grooves for these strips to sit in. I could have just face glued them using a spacer and moved my way across. And I kind of wish I had done that, which you'll see coming up soon, the big problem that I ran into. However, this method did work well for nice evenly spaced grooves and two identical doors. I'm going to call that dumb luck. I need to cut this off. And cut that off I shall with a quick pass on the table saw. And then I could rip up all the white oak strips for the door. And then giving them a quick 1 16th of an inch round over on all the top to ease those edges before glue up. Now this is the second door I glued up. The first one I used PVA glue, and this one I'm just using CA glue. Since it was such a tight fit, I just needed something to hold those strips in place. And then I could rip off the ends flush. Check out the nice curve on that door. So originally I thought it was the water from the PVA glue causing this thing to cup. But after talking to a couple people, Philip Morley and my buddy Kevin at Fine Point, they said because those strips were so tight in there that each one just progressively pushed out the wall just a little bit and just caused that thing to belly or convex or concave, whichever way you want to look at it. So the best solution to balance out the cup and rediscover the flatness was to cut grooves in the backside like so. And then since it had some nice flex to it, I could clamp it flat down on the bench and then impregnate, no, we're not doing that. Uh, and then fill it with filler strips, whack-a-mole style again, sand them flush. And thankfully this did correct the problem, so the doors were saved. Hallelujah! And if we zoom in on this door design close, you can see there's a chamfer on the outside trim that meets each strip perfectly on the top. So after I ripped down some strips for that outer border, I could head back to the router with a chamfer bit and ease those edges nicely to give me that chamfer I need. So here's the setup on the miter saw. I have a sacrificial fence on the bottom, a sacrificial fence on the back. This is actually double stick taped to this so it can't move. I make one cut and now this is my zero clearance insert line. So I can bring my piece up to and whatever line I draw on there, I can line up perfectly with this kerf cut and I know I'm gonna get an exact cut on that line. Now this can be a little dicey when you're holding your hand here and making a cut. But for me, this is safer than turning the blade this way and having your hand here and the blade running back 
where your hand is back here and you can't see it. Here, at least I can sight the blade to my hand and I know exactly where it's going to go. With cuts like these, I always let the blade stop spinning before I pull it up. Otherwise, you have the tendency when this comes up and you move this, the blade will hit here and you'll get tear out, which will make for a sloppy miter. I can take my two pieces that I cut, line those up perfectly in the corner, tighten this down. I'll draw a line here. I'll draw a line here just to, so I know which direction the cut goes. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut another long piece with a miter on the end. So now with the two pieces I cut with a miter on the end, aligned with the corner, I can take the piece with the two miters. Let's make sure it fits. That looks nice. So we'll glue that up. I am going to pop it pin nail in here. And I'll do the same with this piece. These are called Collins miter clamps. Yes, they do leave little indentations but nothing bigger than a 23 gauge pin nail. Just making sure the back of this is flush with the bottom. And these nails are never going to be seen. So corner to corner there, and then I can mark my cut right there. Next, I could drill out the holes in the doors for the rolling door hardware. This is a standard 35 millimeter hole that you would use for cup hinges. And then you just bang these home. It's a little difficult because it is a tight fit, but once you get them in, they're staying in, by the way. You're not getting these out without breaking something. Then I could do a test. So the bottom slide in and the tabs up top actually slide up to engage with the track. And that slides nicely. Then it was time to permanently put this thing together, some glue and dominoes. And I actually use pocket screws on the end panels. Because of the offset and how far it sits off the edge, it was just easier to pocket screw those in. I'm gonna try to minimize any squeeze out here. Squeeze out is the devil, people. And I think a lot of times we use too much glue, more than we need, and we get a lot of squeeze out that has to be cleaned up and it just creates more work. So once I have that clamped down, I make sure it's square. And then I can just keep moving on down the line with my favorite feline inspector, Mr. Jerry. 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 Square? Square? And I could slide in the back, and this is where you do not want a tight fit because that thing will fight you the whole way. That slid in nicely. You can kind of see there on the back where I rounded off those corners. I generally do that. Just makes it much easier for that back to slide down in those grooves rather than a sharp corner to catch on. Then I could secure the ends with the pocket screws as well. I also needed to get some clamping pressure across those middle dividers, so I used calls so I could make sure I get pressure all the way across. And then once that was dry or a few hours later, I could disassemble the clamping setup and check the doors for their sliding functionality. So hanging under the left side of this cabinet will be this mail file folder organizer thing. And I've put together this incredibly detailed drawing to follow. Just rough dimensions. And what I've done is I've milled up some 3 quarter inch white oak and some 3 eighths white oak and glued some panels together. I won't bore you with that process. So now I'll cut some dados in the vertical dividers to accept the horizontal dividers and those will slide in easily. So I set the height of my dado stack to 3 sixteenths of an inch. Now ideally I wanted to use a 3 eighths dado stack but when I milled up my lumber for the dividers it was just a hair under so I had to make two passes to create the groove. And I also made another mistake. If you look at the big red arrow here that groove was not supposed to be there. That's the outside of the case. So I will turn that into a design element. But as you can see here first I'm rabbiting out the back for the back. And then here's that design element. I basically cut a few more grooves in descending size and then filled those with walnut, defying all laws of wood movement. 
plane those flush, and then sanded them flush. Now I'm using dominoes to assemble the majority of this case. I will use some pocket screws as well. So first I'll get all my mortises cut. Then I can do kind of a dry assembly to get the width of all my dividers. And then I can cut those on my cross cut sled on the table saw. And then I need some little finger poles on the front of each shelf. So I'll make myself a template. And then rough out the pieces on the bandsaw a few at a time. And then head over to the router table with a flush trim bit using that pattern to make them all the same. Twinsies, or triplets, quadruplets, quintuplets, sextuplets. Now I decided to pre-finish the majority of the parts of this little mail slot organizer because I'd never be able to get in all those little individual places. And I also did the doors at this point, which proved to be very difficult. I found compressed air blowing out the excess and wiping that off seemed to work quite well. Now, what is the best way to glue this up? So I know those dividers are gonna fight me. Lola, what do you think? Help me. That's not helping. Jerry, what about you? That's not helping. After a quick round table session with my feline companions, I decided to do this in a four stage process. Here is stage one, which was gluing in one section of the dividers and then clamping those up, letting them dry, and then stage two was the center divider, glue, clamp. And then stage three was the top of the case, which I was able to screw into place. Oh wait, that was the bottom. Yeah, that was the bottom. And then the outside, which I was able to clamp and glue. Oh my gosh, it's a lot. Of, oh, it's so heavy, goodness. One more to go, which was the top. And the final stages, Jerry wasn't having it. Now you can also see on the left-hand side, I also cut an extra groove in that piece, but that doesn't matter because it will be going up against the wall. And under the watchful eye of Jerry, the mail organizer is now complete. Now I could work on the two oversized end styles that will be scribed to the wall and the existing cabinet. So I will be attaching these with dominoes. I'm gonna show you a little trick here that my buddy Kevin over at Fine Point showed me, and that is to get these fitted in place and sanded flush this will ensure when it's glued back on that everything remains flush. Then I mark the length and trim it on the table saw. And then come back and round over all those edges so everything is nice and consistent. And then pre-finish them, but not where the glue is going to go. And then I could move on to finishing the rest of the cabinet. I'll be using the Rubio Monocoat Smoke 5% on this as well. And as you can see, the color of the plywood on top doesn't quite match the color of the hardwood edging. It's just the way it goes, unfortunately. It's, it's a struggle a lot of times when you're trying to marry those two materials together. But once that was dry, I could install the 45 degree aluminum channel that will house the LED strip lights. So I'm installing these in the cabinet as well as underneath the cabinet, as you can see here, just to give me a little bottom glow and work light at my desk. So these were pretty simple to install. The adhesive back strip comes right off and then they just stick to the aluminum channel. And then they have these little spots where they can be cut. Ooh, we have light. Ooh, 3000K, 4500K, 6000K. And then I could snap on the milky white cover to just diffuse that light a little bit. And seriously, folks, how cute is little Lola? For the LED strips in the main body of the cabinet, I needed to drill a little access hole to feed the LED strips through, and then the power supply could be run down the side of the cabinet and out of sight. Now these LEDs in the cabinet are actually multicolor, so it's a different product altogether, and I will link all the products I used in the description below. All right, so I got my power pack mounted for the one. This one doesn't even have a power pack. It's just a plug direct. So I got the cord routed up the side, stapled so it won't move. Now here's what the wall above my desk looked like for about a year. I had green tape and the design in mind and a half painted wall and it was a honking mess. I'm using these four inch timber lock screws to attach my French cleat to the wall. I got it level and my wall was out a little bit so I had to shim behind it. You can see a little black shim over on the right there. Disregard the white paint on my face and then lift it up into place and drop it down. And I did pop a few cabinet screws in to secure it to the studs to keep it in place. All right, so I was really hoping to show you how I would scribe this to the wall, but I ran into a couple of issues. Number one, I already glued in the dominoes on the face frame. And with those in place, I can't run my piece through the table saw flat like this in order to see my scribe line. And my table saw is also a left tilt, which when you're scribing something, you want that back bevel so that only the point of your scribe is against the wall and you're not fighting the whole 
thickness of your material. Now I could cut these off and remortise these dominoes. The problem is getting them in the exact right position to match these holes before so that the style is perfectly in alignment with the rails. That is gonna be more difficult. So I'm gonna have to wing this. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a measurement from the wall to my face frame there, which is just over an inch and a half. Down here is just under an inch and a half. So I'm going to mark that top and bottom, connect the dots, and then make that cut. Now since that cut was at a bit of an angle, I used my tapering jig on the table saw. And now we have a nice tight fit. All right, so aside from a little damage to the wall, I think this fit really nicely. And I really lucked out that the wall was straight there. And I'm really happy with that fit. Now I could hang the male center organizer. I did find some studs here, so pop some heavy duty screws in there. And I also popped a couple of screws from the inside of the cabinet down into the top of the male organizer. All right, to get the measurement for this boxed in chase, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a measurement from the cabinet to the inside edge of the domino. It came out to three and an eighth. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use two squares, put one there, I'm gonna put one here, and using my rule, with the edge of the rule butted against the domino. I measure over till the square hits three and an eighth. Right there. And I'm gonna make a mark. Then I could trim that on the table saw and glue it in place. And wipe away that pesky squeeze out. Oh dang, there's a shim hanging down there. I gotta trim that. I'll come back to the LEDs in a minute, but first I can get the doors hung and sliding in the track. This is actually the first time I've ever done sliding doors like this, so I'm really happy with the way they turned out and their functionality. So the drivers for the LED are in that little chase with the cover. I put some holes in it just for some ventilation. All the cords run through the side of the cabinet and then down behind and then get plugged in under there. Still need to wrangle those a little bit better. <laughs> Well, I guess that closes a door and a... That was bad. <laughs> Even Jerry couldn't stay awake for it. And a huge thank you to Simply Safe for sponsoring this video. Be sure to visit simplysafe.com/keithjohnson to learn more.